be barefoot or in socks or whatever. Uh, we were saying there. before that like the building was saying like this is not a place for shoes. Uh -huh. You're inside and you're like, why would anyone have shoes in here? Yeah, I know the floor is so nice yeah. on your bare feet. Yeah. There might be an airship in town that is a little less conventional. It's one of my grounds first fields. So you can already tell, Blackwater cell. Uh -huh. That's where our sewage is being treated out here. I think someone bought it. it was, it's mostly made out of beer cans. Yeah, I was just about it. Um, I don't know any other house around here that you might fit the description. I got to draw a blank. We'll take them off in the, the garage here. What stage did you work on uh, the house? Oh, we were just putting in all, all the that's pretty much where we left off. Oh, cool. Good boy. Yeah, sweet. Working in the kitchen, putting a finish, starting in the bathroom. Sure. But the finishing touches, that must have been the academy right after ours. Yeah. Have you been in a ship before? Uh-huh. I have. Okay. All right, close this door behind you. Awesome. So, it's definitely a lot more cleaner than I remember. So, uh, here, let me see if the living room is good to go. So, yeah, you guys Just tell us in. to move out of the way. So. That's okay. Don't okay. worry about it. Hello. I'm gone. Okay. Good. Hello. Yeah, you know. Hey. So, you guys have four? How's it going, man? It's good. Three? Uh, I would call. Um, I would call. <laughs> so, um, I was going to give my explanation of how everything works here. You guys can definitely listen in or you can wander the rest of the building. It's up to you guys. Um, uh, for my explanation, do you want me to turn off the music or? Doesn't matter. Okay, cool. Do you want me to be facing any specific way or? No. Okay, cool. So, um, I'm going to start from the bottom. Okay. Uh, basically, Mike Reynolds came out here in 1969 to uh, experiment with, uh, well, he came out here to motorcycle race, actually. Uh, many people don't really know, but he was actually coming out here to dodge the draft for Vietnam by trying to injure himself <laughs> motorcycle racing. Okay. Uh, how, if he succeeded or not, I'm really not too sure. Uh, but he, um, when he got here, he realized that nobody was enforcing building codes or regulations or anything, uh, you know, like that. Sure. Um, so he had seen an article about the, you know, baby boom generation generating mountains of garbage around the world, and we don't know what to do with it. So um, his brain started working, and he realized, you know, no codes. You know, I'm going to start building homes out of garbage and see, you know, what that looks like. Um, so. Um, I don't have the picture on me, but it was 1960. It was 1970 when he built the first can house. Um, it was all beer cans. Um, I think it took like uh, 3,000 cans or something like that. It was pretty intense. Um, but that was kind of the first step towards uh, the airship concept uh, eventually. So um, an airship today is made up of six core principles. Uh, the first core principle being uh, reused and recycled, uh, you know, reclaimed materials and natural materials. Uh, within the load-bearing walls, we have tires from the ground to the ceiling. Um, I usually give my spiel in the visitor center. I know that the visitor center is made up of just over 700 tires. This one, uh, if I had to guess, probably close to a thousand tires. Uh, I wouldn't doubt it. Um, each tire is packed with three to four entire wheelbarrows full of dirt, and you take a sledgehammer and you pound away until that tire becomes a compact 300 to 350 pound brick. Um, within the non-load bearing walls, uh, and the walls dividing the greenhouse uh, fire beds and stuff like that, we have bottles and cans. Um, you know, this building probably took close to a thousand bottles and cans together, I'm pretty sure. Um, so yeah, and of course we got the adobe on the walls. Uh, we can dig that up in our backyard. We have the perfect soil to clay ratio to make adobe, so it's really nice material that we tend to use out here a lot. Uh, the second core principle is uh, thermal solar heating and cooling. We can naturally heat and cool these buildings without the use of energy or fuel. Um, and uh, we do that a couple of different ways. So um, one of the main reasons is thermal mass. Uh, the brick, uh, the tire walls that um, you know are those dense thermal mass bricks. Um, 
of course offer thermal mass properties which allow you to heat store away temperatures. So um, you'll notice that the windows are slanted on the south facing side here. Uh, that's pretty important. I'll actually uh, mention that all of our buildings are facing true south. That's so we can capture the sun year round. Um, you'll notice that the windows are pitched just slightly um, angled, uh, mm -hmm. and that's on purpose. So you'll notice in the height of the summertime, the summer is not uh, the sun is not reaching past the first set of planter beds here. So it's keeping your thermal mass in your floor and in your walls ice cool to the touch and shade. Um, and ultimately in the winter time, at the height of the winter solstice, you'll actually see the sun dip way lower in the sky and the sun will reach back all the way to this back wall. Uh, as the sun rises in the morning, you'll literally feel the floor and the walls heating up around and underneath you. Um, and, uh, you know, same way that thermal mass works, we can store that heat away uh, so that the sun goes down at night during the winter time and it gets cold outside. The warmth is released from the walls and from the floor. Um, in a sense, in winter time, you're trapped in like this permanent uh, heating cycle that your house is always uh, using, which is pretty awesome. Um, we are utilizing vents and cooling tubes to cool the building down. Um, you'll notice we got the cooling tubes here. Uh, be cool if we had like a piece of paper to show it for you. Can I, ask, um, can I ask you a question about these? Yeah, definitely. So the Earthship that I stayed in last night uh -huh. doesn't have cooling tubes. <laughs> okay. And it's one of the older models and it doesn't have um, the greenhouse in the front. It has planters like right next to the right. kitchen thing. Gotcha. What What's the major difference in like the temperature control? Uh, the major, uh, so those older models, there was a couple things. One, they didn't use cooling tubes. They were just utilizing sky vents right. to uh, help vent the hot air out of the building. Right. And yeah, you didn't have double greenhouse, the double layer of greenhouse going on. So you had the outside, right outside the glass there. Um, so what we found was that um, in the newer models, when we slapped an extra layer of glass on the side, because mm -hmm. these older models, they would pretty much get, you know, usually they get really hot in the summertime, right. and they get pretty cold in the winter time. Right. Um, you know, your back wall with the stable earth temperatures of dirt all the way to the ceiling, you're radiating about 58 degrees year round. Mm -hmm. It's really your glass that you have to worry about where you're bright, you know, exposed to the outside there. So we found that if you slap a second layer of glass on that, it's almost like a buffer zone to the outside. Because okay. we're not worrying about the back side, only the south side. So if it is, you know, basically in the winter time or the summertime, the most extreme temperatures are gonna be within that greenhouse and it'll get more comfortable as you get closer to the interior space. Okay. Um, and with the help of windows and doors, you know, let's say on a summer day, we keep those closed, it'll help keep the cool temperatures within the building. I gotcha. Um, and yeah. of course, you can see the sky vents out there. Um, in the older models, we only had sky vents and we did not have cooling tubes. What we found, especially in the older models, we'd have sky vents in the interior space. Right. On a day like this, you'd open up your sky vents mm -hmm. and you'd have hot air dropping into your building. Right. So what we did was we kept the sky vents in the greenhouse space to vent that hot air out of the building. Of course, hot air rises. But then we added these cooling tubes. Yep. So these cooling tubes are about you know, the, the side, the length will vary depending on your environment, but uh, they're about 50 feet long um, and they stick all the way through the other side of the berm protruding out there. Um, with the help of the windows up top and the sky vent, we can create a convection process uh, where hot air is getting pulled into the tubes, getting cooled under that stable earth 58 degrees of temperature coming out like air conditioning. So yep. those are the two main differences in temperature control between the new older models and the newer ones. It makes sense too, because I noticed like this morning or last night, the place didn't really, even with all the, the, the back roof fence open, it didn't really cool off until I opened the door. Right. In the, like to the outside. Exactly. Yeah. It needs that, it needs to be pulled through the building. So yeah, so definitely these are key things that really helped improve temperature control. And so, I'm sorry. No, okay. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> so um, I'm really focused on the internal growing system because that's my perspective in terms of the plants production. So for a lot of these ones where the plants are older, it seems like they're just going to grow up here. So what will happen? You'll trim them back. And also, are these plants particularly chosen because I saw there's a banana, so that's obviously for fruit, but right. are these specifically chosen? I see maybe like the aloe is medicinal, but right. are they air plants, plants that add different kinds of oxygenation? So I will say that at least in the rental buildings, we're planting plants that don't need too much maintenance. Of course. Because, um, you know, we'd have to be in here all the time and we're renting it out. So the plants we've chosen isn't optimal for either food production or air purification. It's really just our choice because we're renting these buildings out and we want easy, simple plants to build. Um, as for the fig trees, every winter we cut them back entirely. We cut down everything. 
Um, and as soon as uh, late spring comes, it looks just like this. Uh, so the fig tree is really efficient at growing back. We actually trim it back during the winter time because we want optimal sunlight gain into the building. That's one big thing. You're not going to plant major trees that don't lose their leaves in the winter time in the south facing side or in the black water cell outside because it's going to block your solar gain during the winter. Exactly, because I was thinking about how these would block out some of the heat if right. it could be intentional or unintentional. Exactly. And which is the building that has two floors? Um, it looked like it did have trees. We have multiple buildings that have two stories. I thought Earthships had to be one story. Mm -mm. Yeah, we found that if you stack, you know, I was much to my surprise, you know, I was like, tire walls, you know, two stories, that sounds kind of scary. Basically, you bring your tire wall up and you lay down a bond beam, you can put down another set, a whole another set of tires, uh, giving you two stories. I wouldn't be surprised if you could do even three stories, yeah. Um, so yeah, we're growing certain plants in here. Uh, we're growing a lot of tropical plants because we want to show off that we can grow these things even in the height of winter when it's negative 30 degrees outside. So this is kind of a bad, you know, a bad example of what you should grow. I mean, it really doesn't matter what. <laughs> it's you grow. Grow. Right. It's more, yeah. It's easy to take care of. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we run solar thermal heating and cooling, and I think I pretty much covered how that works. Um, you know. I've seen it hit negative 30 degrees out here in the height of winter time, which is crazy to have no heating source in your house whatsoever. Our older models used to come with kivas and fireplaces and things like that. Mm -hmm. Our new models just don't come with that anymore because they're able to stabilize their temperature so efficiently. Um, so, you know, tropical banana trees right next to the window that's getting hit by negative 30 degrees is pretty awesome. Um, so that heat during the day um, can store away in the ground in the thermal mass and, you know, release at night. So that's how we can achieve that. It feels like it's about 78, 79 in here, ish. Yeah, and you know, I don't have a, thermo a thermometer or something, so I can't really tell you. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say it's about mid 70s or so. Okay. Yeah. So how much difference does the greenhouse make as far as the buffer zone? Like if it was 100 outside for two days, would it be manageable in here or would you be sweating your ass off? It would, and you know, this again, we're in a rental building and it's kind of a bad example of how optimal these buildings can be because, for example, we have these renters in here that are constantly opening and closing right. the doors, uh, especially the cleaning staff here. Um, and yeah, so, uh, you know, it probably, at least I've never stayed in inertia mm -hmm. through 100 degrees for multiple days. Right. Um, but at least what I've been told, um, you know, it would probably stay about this temperature, you know, even in that. that gotcha. Heat. Okay. So this was built as a demo house. This was this was actually built to sell. It built to sell. Uh huh. But we rented out in the meanwhile. Um, and honestly, same thing with the visitor center when the All doors right, are opening and sale, closing. Right? And yeah, this is on sale. Yeah. Uh, when you have the door, you know, you're gonna want to regulate your house better if you were living in here. Yeah. And, you know, there's ways to keep it nice and cool. Um, so you yeah. Said, you said it was for sale. Is there an average cost per square foot for these guys? Out here in Taos County, the average cost per square foot, and that is your company, the Airship Biotechure coming in and building your whole structure for you, including your systems, meaning you move in, you don't have those utility bills anymore, right. at least for electricity, water, and so on. Um, it usually, on average, teeters between $250 and $300 per square foot. Okay. Um, keep in mind, there's a lot of ways to raise that and lower that. Mm -hmm. I was told that just even, um, you know, let's say you tell them you want this model, however size, and they'll tell you how many bottles, cans, and tires exactly you'd need, and if you actually started collecting those materials, they'd start cutting your cost per square foot down. Okay. Um, and also, regulations, location, uh, you know, building codes right. have a really big decision factor on your pricing and price per square sure. foot. I grew up in the state of Florida where off-grid living is totally 100% illegal. So, <laughs> so prices are going to change depending on where you go. Um, so third core principle um, is uh, alternative energy. Uh, we can, uh, you know, none of these buildings are hooked up to power lines at all. Um, we, you know, again, the visitor center has eight panels and we're generating one and a half kilowatts when the sun is out. Um, so we can have a much smaller power system for entire families because we're not using energy to heat or cool the building. So we're using that for pumps, projectors, computers, TVs, internet, all that good stuff. Um, so families can survive off one and a half kilowatts, uh, but it depends. We will size your system according to who's moving in so you don't run out of power, uh, you know, depending on your family size. So we normally have the, we always have the batteries uh, hooked up to the panels, so we're storing that power away on batteries. Okay. Um, so even if the sun goes down for the night or, you know, whatever, that's cloudy for the next couple days, you have power stored away. Cool. Um, at least in the visitor center, we're using eight standard deep cycle lead acid batteries. Um, 
and like I said, that is enough. To, you know, we had a party until like one in the morning at one night, and we had no fear of losing energy at all. So awesome. um, definitely, it was all good. Um, I, we build all over the world. We get over 300 days of full sun a year here in New Mexico, so we can totally rely off solar power. Um, but we do build in areas that don't get as much sun as we do. I've seen airships outfitted with um, hydroelectric, wind power, um, you know, geothermal. And nowadays, you can even generate electricity from methane gas. So um, there's a lot of alternatives that you can have nowadays. Um, it's nice that off-grid living is legal here in the, uh, New Mexico, you know, in Florida where I grew up, you know, you have to, you can't have batteries. You have to hook up right. to the grid and you have to sell that back for something that, you know, it's worth less. It's worth more than what they pay you for, but uh, anyway. Um, so that's the third or fourth core principle, I believe. Yeah, the fourth core principle is water catchment, uh, which I think is my favorite part of the whole uh, airship concept. Um, our roofs are, catch uh, you know, none of these buildings are set up to, um, None of our buildings are hooked up to water lines, so no wells, no water lines. Um, we have water catchment space on the roof. Mm -hmm. uh, this building, I believe, is, what is this, 2,000? 2,200. 2,200 square feet. So we have all of that space allotted for water catchment on the roof. Um, the newer models now have a pitched roof that's going directly north, so um, we can bring the water straight down into the cisterns that are buried within the back burn. Um, the older models were pitching their roof south so that if it snowed, the sun would come out and melt the snow off your roof. But we had the cisterns buried within the back, so you'd have to pull the water south and then back north, mm -hmm. which was causing divisions and angles, weird angles in the roof structure, which were giving way to moisture issues and leaks. Yep. Uh, we've now uh, gotten past that, uh, thank God. We now have a uh, north facing roof. Instead of having the sun melt it because it's pitched north, mm -hmm. we have copper tubes lining the roof and there we're pumping glycol through it to melt the snow. So, um, that was the butterfly roof design, right? The original one? where it had like a V-shape to catch the water and then it was sloped to one side. Right, uh, the older yeah. stuff? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, we call that the dreaded valley, the, the, the angle, yeah. Okay. It would cause ice dams and just break your roof apart. It okay. was really, really bad. Um, and it took us a bit to get past that. I'm glad we finally evolved to a different stage of roof. So um, yeah, no more ice dams, no more leak issues. It's pretty nice. Um, you do have the glycol pumping through a closed loop system, so it's not too big of a deal. You fill it and you pretty much don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, so we can, water goes a very long way in an airship. Um, I'll kind of take you on a journey through water in an airship. Um, water is caught off the roof and is put back into the cisterns that are buried within the back burn. We have them slightly elevated so that they can be gravity fed into the building without the need of pumps or energy. Um, so it's, still, it's stored in there waiting for you to use your water. Um, uh, you know, I could actually show you the water gun sure. module first. Cool, it's right here. Alright, so once your water is stored inside the back cisterns, it's waiting for you to use your appliances. Your water is going to come in through your cistern. It's going to go, it's going to hit a micron mesh filter there before it hits your pump to send it through the rest of the system. It will hit a 100 or 500 micron mesh system. Um, I'm sorry, micron mesh filter. And then that's where it goes to your appliances, washer machines, sinks, showers, whatever. Um, if you want it to drink water, it's going to continue through a 1000 or 1500 me uh, mesh micron filter. And then it'll hit an antibacterial ceramic drinking water filter. You would want a dryer. <laughs> I think they did it so they can wash the sheets easily and all that good stuff. Yeah. And I guess they're selling the house, so you know, it would come with a washer. Yeah. So Mike Reynolds has uh, been experimenting with more storage space for clothes and stuff that was in the older models. One of the big deal breakers is that a lot of people had no space to store their clothes in the behind them. So. Uh, this bathroom here is kind of more of a conventional style bathroom. Um, there's another one back in here that's a bit more wild looking. Oh yeah, the place might be inside. Cool. And you can instantly feel the difference just stepping out into the greenhouse. Oh, I don't want to interrupt you. That's okay. I feel like I'm talking to you. No, no, not at all. Ask anything you want. Thank you. 
and then just close this door behind you guys when you come through. So yeah, freaking banana tree. Uh, they just took off the flower. It was a massive purple flower that was dangling. It was really nice. But it was getting dry and starting to flake apart, so. Kyle, um, so personally, I like that there's bugs inside because it's indicative that it's a living ecosystem. But right. do you ever have anyone think about that, comment on that? Yeah, you know, I've had people come and be like, you know, why would you want dirt and grossness in your house? <laughs> and I'm, you know, I don't really know what to say to those people all the time, but yeah, you know, a greenhouse is going to attract bugs and pests. It's the perfect environment for these bugs and what they want. So you will always, with a greenhouse, draw some sort of, you know, maybe, you know, it, it could be anything, especially pests like scale or white flies for the plants or something like that. Um, it really depends on how well you manage it. The only earthship I've seen a severe bug problem in is, and it's not too severe, is the visitor center. And that's because people come in with like cinnamon rolls and food and their drinks and they're eating and they throw it in the garbage. I haven't seen the bugs that bad in any other earthship yet. So definitely uh, it's not too common to have a problem with bugs, especially if you keep, you know. So if it was your own home, you would keep the eating separate from the garden. Exactly. And if I did eat out here in the greenhouse, I'd be very careful about dropping crumbs and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, it's the perfect environment for bugs. So if you give them even more reason to come in, they're going to they're gonna find a way in. Also, um, especially in the visitor center, we strategically plant cer certain plants to prevent pests and that kind of stuff. Tobacco plants are really big on um, deterring pests and will strategically place them in the, in the planter beds. Uh, myself, you know, I've extracted some tobacco uh, to use as um, pest, basically natural insecticide, and it works really well. So there's a lot of ways that you can find Cool. <laughs> is, there, is there a particular reason that you guys build these containment walls around the outside that blocks the view? Yeah, so, um, at least here in the neighborhood, we so far have about 76 privately owned ownership homes. And you'll notice that everyone has these big, giant, open, south-facing windows. Mm -hmm. um, if you really didn't have any kind of barriers or plants or something, it'd be very easy, at least in this building, from the road to see directly inside the house. Okay. Especially if binoculars or a drone or something <laughs> like that. Makes sense. So, yeah, we're building these just so that we can have a little bit more privacy. Okay. Not related to flash flooding? Not related to flash flooding. Okay. Um, and, yeah, you know, um, that is a good point. You'll notice that for the black water cell, we do dig out the... Um, that area just a bit because we don't want our black water cell to overflow with rain. So yeah, that could be another reason why they do some of those containment walls to prevent some extra water from flowing. Is this berm here for a re for like a functional purpose? Um, that berm, and this is actually kind of high. Um, you'll notice outside. that we kind of dug down in this building. A lot of our any, outside here. Yeah, yeah, the little bear. Yeah. Um, We've been kind of swapping back and forth. We found in the past that if we dig down, we can really hit stable earth temperatures. But we also found that if we stay right on the grade and we kind of bury ourselves in, we can achieve similar temperature stability like that. This building seems to be dug down just a bit. So they might be just experimenting with different ways to contain the, the thermal mass. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Uh, the floor might be a little wet. Uh, So uh, this is the master bedroom. Cooling tubes in the closet? Cooling tubes in the closet. Okay. Um, I get, you know, they do come through the back tire wall, so that was really the only way to kind of make it fit there. Cool. With extra closet space. And you got your shower here. Oh wow, this one's really nice. Yeah, no, they- This is different. Yeah, this one's a bit different. I don't even see a light switch. It might be on the outside. Yeah. That's okay. Okay, thank you. I don't know if you wanted to see the way the water comes through the reception cell here. Sure. I could show you. I'll turn on the water. It should only be about 15 seconds or so. So this is the uh, this is the uh, the cell. This is where the water comes in, and of course, all your materials caught before it enters the planter bed and goes through the rest of the building. Normally, we have stockings on this. You'll see the water coming through now. I'll mm -hmm. turn that off. So, um, yeah, that's, you know, we have small holes po poked through just in case we don't have the stocking so we can catch all the material on there and scoop it out afterwards. Personally, I would put some stockings or something over it just so I can switch it out easily and swap it with a new fresh one. Okay. And not have to go digging around trying to pick up gunk. And, and that stuff. works the same way as the kitchen. It goes into the catch basin and then 
Exactly, and then it's gonna hit. Uh, it's gonna hit a slope and be gravity fed through the rest of your gray water cell. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I like the shower's pretty cool. Is there a functional reason it's lifted off the ground? Um, I believe it's lifted above just to bring the water um, with it's extra gravity. For gravity, right? Yeah, exactly. Even the one that I stayed in that has a tub, it's oh, yeah, the like, tub. yeah, it's really elevated. Like you have to step up and in. Yeah, <laughs> exercise. Yeah, the more gravity flow we have, the less energy we need to pull the water through That's other areas That's what I figured, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, cool. So. Uh, if you guys, oh, uh, yeah, the airlocks here. This is pretty, pretty big here. So, if you guys can close this behind you when you're done inside. Um, so, our newer buildings are now utilizing airlocks. Uh, you know, it's almost like a dry, uh, a, dr a mud room or something like that. Um, you know, let's say it's 18 degrees outside and you have nice stable 70 degree temperatures within the building. Uh, in the older models, you'd open up your front door and you'd have 18 degrees come in, you'd lose your heat and no more stable temperatures. So we found that if you just put a simple airlock, you can come in, close the door behind you and open your door into your interior space and you won't have any fluctuation in your stable temperatures. Really simple stuff. Uh, but really, you know, small things like that have really helped to improve temperature stability. It's just literally two doors? Right. Okay. Yep, two doors. Um, I've seen newer earth chips for sale, like ones that were built recently that have the burning stove, or some kind of stove, and that seems to me to be a warning sign because you need that. New buildings? Okay. Newer chips? Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, went through all of our newer buildings that we've built in the past three years. Not here, elsewhere. Right, at least here in, for the company buildings, for the past three years, we haven't installed stoves, fireplaces, or anything. that at all. Of course, stoves for cooking. Yeah. But that's about it. You know, they say in these new models that baking one batch of cookies or one log in the fireplace is enough to heat your house for almost two days. Wow. So, um, yeah, they're so efficient at stabilizing their temperatures. If there are newer ships coming out with fireplaces and stuff like that, and they're using our new, um, you know, tweaks that we've done, um, it's either for style or for fun. You know, a lot of people will buy this and say, you know, a fireplace would still be nice or something like that. So, have you worked on a lot of airship builds? I've worked on a couple different ones. Okay. Uh, I haven't worked on. I've I've worked on three so far. Any in Montana? No, not in Montana. All here in Taos. Okay. Yeah. There was a super cool one that I saw in uh, Montana. Cool. Uh, it's a Big Sky Airship. Big Sky? Big Sky. Big Sky. Yeah, yeah that, that's a pretty amazing Airship. It looks really different outside. It's massive. Yeah, yeah. it's awesome. And you could tell um, that they wanted to go for more of a, almost more conventional style on the exterior. Like a mountain right? cabin. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, the stone and then the wood and yeah, it's it looks really nice cool. though. It's yes. Awesome. Yes, it is. Cool. So um, that's pretty much it for this building. Um, one thing I do like to mention is, um, you know, e a lot of people wonder why we have east and west entrances to the house and not north or south, you know, like a front door or something like that. Um, and that's because if you put a hole in your back berm that's helping stabilize your temperatures, you're going to be compromising that stability of temperature for a window or for a door or something like that. Uh, so we tend to put the doors on the east and west side so we can keep the blanket, you know, full without holes. Um, I call the berm a big blanket. Um, and also what's a really cool thing with the east and west entrances is that if you wanted to ever expand your airship, a lot of people tend to um, start airships really small and build upon it as they go. Um, let's say you wanted to expand your airship. You're going to go outside and you're going to run walls along the door on the exterior, close it up and you'll have a whole nother module to you know, call home. So. How does the, um, how's the garage as far as temperature control since you have these big doors that are uh, open to the outside and everything. So, um, honestly, and I've been in a lot of garages. This is some of the, this is one of the most comfortable garages temperature wise I've ever been in. Um, even in the winter time, you know, you're going to have that sun low in the sky blazing through here. Out of all the rooms, this is usually one of the most comfortable rooms to be in, uh, you know, at least compared to the main greenhouse or something like that. It's pretty nice in here. So plenty of thermal mass to heat up during the winter time and during the summertime it can heat up a bit, but because the space is so wide and open uh, with the help of vents, it can stay pretty cool, you know, even in the height of summertime. So if you were, I'm just thinking of this as an extra room. If you were to um, design an earth ship with the intention of absolutely maximizing food production, mm -hmm. like for a community center or just community eating area right. for a lot of people, Right. what would you 
enhance or change to enable that to happen? Um, I personally would widen the greenhouse. Um, you can see in here there was just one row of greenhouse space. Um, our newer models, if we're experimenting with Viacitos here, is a double wide greenhouse. It'll be uh, two layers of plant beds with more plants. Um, I'll be taking you to the Phoenix next, and that's really a good idea to show you, you know, what you could do to really boost your temp uh, food production. I will say if you're dealing with a standard kind of Earthship greenhouse like this, uh, hanging buckets, which we're doing in the visitor center, is really good at Sounds preserving. Good. Exactly. Lower, lower yeah, yeah, you hang, well, you hang the bucket just about here, and you're just basically conserving growing space. Second layer. You're, yeah, exactly. Layer. You might have to manually water it, or you can set up a system to automatically drip it in, uh, but adding hanging uh, buckets to grow stuff in will definitely help conserve space and grow more food. Um, also, we have someone here in the community um, who is experimenting with something called permaponics, and he's uh, it's kind of like a mix of aquaponics and permaculture, um, and he's switching out the plant beds for. Love that. It's everywhere when you said that. <laughs> permaponics. Yeah. <laughs> Wait. So, perma what does that mean? Aquaponics and permaculture. It's kind of intricate, and I wasn't able to really absorb it fully. He does an academy class. Um, basically, it's similar to aquaponics in that you'll have a reservoir at the bottom and it'll come in and fill your plants and then drain down. But what he does is he's only using waste products to boost the nutrient gain inside the water. So you're not using fish uh, because to buy food and stuff like that and keep the fish alive is a whole extra step. Couldn't the fish be... Um so you're going to have separate spigots throughout your house, especially just for your drinking water, and that's you know where you're going to get your drinking water from. Um, so, so yeah, that's basically it. Really simple. Um, this is kind of standard. It can be interchangeable. You can add UV filters or you know charcoal filters, whatever you think see whatever you see fit for your water that you're taking. In. So. Um, So yeah, the water goes through the micro mesh filter and it's waiting for you to use your appliances. Water goes down, the, uh, you use the water in the sink, it goes down the drain, and then it hits a reception cell here. Um, let's see. It's gonna be kind of difficult to see, but um, the water is um, uh, hits a reception cell here. Uh, normally we have women's stockings slipped over the tube and it catches all the particulates that go through. Uh, for whatever reason, they don't have the stockings on right now, but whatever is coming through is being caught on the bottom uh, face and we'll just scoop it out afterwards. So that's hair, you know, soap scum, anything that's coming through the sinks or the drains. Kyle, a question? Yeah. So um, it's my understanding that gray water can't be used for plants that are either herb herbal, medicinal, or that you like basically food grade plants. Okay. So these are what these are with gray water runoff? All of this is gray water. So this couldn't technically be Well, um I don't know where you read I know that if we pour, we don't pour gray water on top because it'll leave residues and yeah. it could leave stuff uh, you know on the leaves. Right. But if you're being if it's watered so okay. Actually our kitchen sinks are going straight to septic. That is a code that we have to follow. Um, there is controversy between that, especially if you you know eat meat and have grease and that kind of stuff. You really don't want that in your plants or on your plants. So at least our kitchen sinks are going straight out to septic. If we are using something that's not bad with the plants, we have a valve that we can open or close to send it through the rest of the gray water system with the rest of the water, or we can close it and send it straight out to the septic tank outside. So um, we're watering the plants from the roots underneath, so we're really not getting films or any kind of nasty stuff on the leaves and the produce. But yeah, you don't want to use like meat, you know, kind of stuff or, or you know, there's certain things down your drain that you don't want to use. Um, of course, when you live in an airship, um, you're going to have to change your lifestyle a bit. You're going to be using biodegradable, eco-friendly soaps, shampoos, no more pouring, pouring bleach and uh, Drano down your drain. You will harm your plants or harm yourself if you're eating those plants. So in that respect, we're pouring things down that the plants can handle. So once the water hits your reception cell, it will go on to these planter beds out here. Uh, these planter beds are five to six feet deep, slightly slanted the entire way. Water makes its way through one end and makes its way all the way down, watering your plants for you. Uh, your plants know you can tap in, uh, you know, you know, their plants know there's water down there and they'll grow roots down to tap into that. Um, 
So yeah, and then after it makes its way all the way to the end of the planter cell, um, it waits in a deep reservoir for you to flush your toilet. Uh, so that water's already been used twice. You've used it in your shower or washing machine or whatever, and it's fed your plants, and now you're flushing your toilet with it. And you know, we can go check out the toilet in a second. The water is pretty clean, it's pretty amazing. Um, and that's your third use, flushing the water down the toilet, and that goes out to a conventional septic tank outside, where cultural bacteria and an anaerobic process takes place to break down your solid waste. Your solid waste is broken down, liquid waste overflows into a botanical black water cell. They're usually about like seven feet deep and 12 feet wide, but it really depends on how many people, you know, what codes and permits you know, dictate how many people are using your toilet, that kind of thing. Um, it might change in size, um, but that's where your waste ends up, in a blackwater botanical cell where plants treat it and use it as nutrients and grow larger. Um, by code and permitting, we have to have a conventional leach field off the other side, but we found that it doesn't ever really make it there, that it stays in the, you know, maybe because it's so dry out here, it really ends up in your black water cell and your plants suck that all up. It's pretty awesome. Uh, you can always tell where the black water cells are in an airship yard, especially in the dry mesa like this, because usually the biggest green and biggest trees and plants are growing out of it. And again, back to what I said earlier, you don't want to plant something big that's not going to lose its foliage in the winter time because you want to draw that sun in during the summer, the winter time. A couple questions about the um, the catch basin and the, the do you have to use different types of soils for each one to filter the water or is it specific? No, so at least I don't know there's any specific soil that we have to use. I, I'll, you know, at the bottom it's rubber lined of course. Mm -hmm. I mean at the very bottom you have large rocks. Then it goes uh, gradually into smaller rocks, little pieces of gravel, and then you have about three inches of sand on top of the rocks. Okay. And then you have your soil on top to, you know, the sand is dividing the soil from getting into the rocks. Okay. So, um, We've done a bunch of different uh, soils. We've even used mesa soil outside, which does not work. Don't use mesa soil. Um, so yeah, this is just some potting soil mixed. Uh, we bought some potting soil from the local hydroponic store. And we mixed mm -hmm. it in with our um, compost that we make here. Okay. Yeah. Six, feet, six feet of potting soil across this, even mixed with compost. It's going to be... It's a great investment. It's, yeah, definitely. It's going to be about four feet. Four feet of Four or three sand feet. Rock. Yeah, exactly. Because that's above the rock and the sand. And with the composting, um, so of course our home was also a rental home. Yours too, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. But so I saw there was a compost bucket under the sink. So is there, for people who live here, do they have compost systems or does the community have a large scale compost system? So we have a big compost communal compost system out here. So everyone in the community is welcome to bring their food scraps out here. And we make some really amazing mm -hmm. compost. Um, and of course, some people here definitely take self sustainability very seriously and they have their own compost systems. So you have your um, options. How about, um, like, excuse me for asking this, but I'll just ask. So, um, so the the toilets are on a septic system. Does anybody have drop drop latrines or use humanure? There is one person in the community here because actually for our codes and permitting here, which this wasn't a thing in the past, but this is some newly enforced stuff. Um, we, and I think this is since the early 90s, we're not allowed to have compost toilets or human urine toilets. Mm -hmm. um, we're supposed to have flush toilets that go out to a septic system. Is that because of the way the desert works? No, there's definitely a lot of, you can definitely do hue manure and that kind of stuff safely. It's, you know, if you ask these code people, it's always about safety. Um, there's always more to that than just safety, especially nowadays. Because I know Michael Reynolds, I forget what it's called, maybe you remember, but he did that like... He made the, solar toilets. The solar toilets yeah. in the Himalayas, and he, it, which is, could work here. Exactly, course. it can work here. Um, it's mostly and, political. Yeah. It's mostly political, yeah. Yeah, you know, people don't want to, you know, they don't want you to deal with your waste. They want you to send it out and away. Um, there is one person here in the community who was kind of grandfathered in. She, her house is sitting on top of solid basalt, and she's, I think, the only one allowed to have, like, uh, compost in the toilet. We're going to start mopping because we got two other places to clean. It's, two, it's check and start at 2.30. Okay. So we got to get Okay. Open. Gotcha. So cool. she's going to start mopping, and then if you guys want to see it in the front floor, I can tell that. Okay. Okay. Sweet. So, um... Yeah, and real quick, because I'm about to be finished, fifth core principle is sewage treatment, which we pretty much already went over. Mm -hmm. Botanical cells take care of that. Sixth core principle is food production. Of course, after everything I've said, you know, you have water, you have sun year round, you have the perfect ambient temperatures. You can grow 
I mean, we're growing tropical plants out here in the high desert. So um, those are really the six core principles that make up an Earthship today. And what's really awesome is it's constantly evolving. What we have now is pretty amazing and is only going to get better as time goes on. Just in a year span, our buildings will change and be modified and tweaked. So those guys, were they just hosing off the greenhouse walkway or were they actually adding additional water to the planter So beds? some plants do require to be top watered. Um, it's not all the plants, um, especially this building is fairly new. So the root okay. systems and stuff like that aren't fully mature and they may not be reaching all the way down to the water. Okay. Um, I was but, just curious, as it just being a rental, is that enough flow to like take care of most of the stuff. Exactly, and that's probably another reason why they're top watering, just in case, um, you know, and they are trying to keep it in tip top shape and as mm -hmm. nice as they can, so they're doing some extra work that really isn't necessary. Do you have any idea how old these plants are that are out there? Um, I don't know how old the banana, some of the banana trees are fruiting, which means, you know, I'm no banana expert, but <laughs> I believe they're about at least two to three years old. Okay. Um, and I know that we plant some plants in here that are already kind of mature and yeah. aren't. Okay. I wouldn't so. be surprised if that banana was five or six. Five or six. But yeah. I don't have a sense of how, like I don't have a personal sense of how fast this soil produces. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we can go uh, check out the, oh, uh, there's one thing I did want to touch up on that I didn't mention uh, is propane stoves. Um, here in the community, we are using, not everybody, but we're using propane, about $150 a year in propane to cook on the stove or dry in your dryer. Uh, like I said, not everybody has this, and nowadays there's actually biodigestive methane systems where you can extract your own methane gas from your own animal and human waste and hook it up to a, you know your stove or your dryer and actually not pay for these things anymore. So um, this is going on. I've actually seen it out on the Maya, Mesa, the biodigestive systems, uh, but that's actually against the codes here, one of the regulations we have to follow, so we're not allowed to use those new biodigestive systems. So we're about, you know, some of us are paying about 150 a year. Sun, and it depends on your climate. If you don't have too much in the cold winter, you're not going to be worried too so much about solar gain in the winter time. Yeah. So, yeah. It's probably like corn and tomatoes and something like that. Right, yeah, and there's, it's definitely. Um, that's one aspect. Earthships is not slacking in, but we want to see more work and experimentation done, is more experimentation with growing because right now we have these standard planter beds, but yeah, if you wanted to feed a whole family, you're gonna need a bit more space. So did you say James Fry, is he the main one doing that right now? James Fry is the 